In the previous video, we introduced the multi-grid method. And remember, it's not so much a new method as it is a way to enhance or accelerate the other iterative methods such as gauss L or ADI that we've discussed in previous videos. So we motivated the idea behind the method, which is based on the observation that higher frequency modes in the air of a numerical solution as we're iterating tend to be more effectively reduced as compared to low order modes. And we showed that a lower order mode appears as if it's a higher order mode on a coarser grid. So in this and the next video, we're going to look at the methodology behind multigrid. I'm going to go into sufficient detail so you can get a good sense for the method, how it works and why it works. Also, so if you were to use the multigrid method in the future, even if it's an open source code, for example, I want you to be able to choose the parameters and the approaches that are used wisely based on an understanding of the underlying method itself. So far, we've been focusing on the Poisson equation as a standard canonical example of an elliptic partial differential equation. Here I want to introduce a more general second order PDE just to show that there's no reason why we can't extend these techniques to more complicated elliptic partial differential equations. So here we have a second order linear partial differential equation with variable coefficients. So we have second order derivatives in x and y, first order derivatives in x and y, we have a zeroth order derivative term, and then we have these variable coefficients on each of those terms, as well as a non-homogeneous right-hand side. So this would be elliptic if a times c is greater than zero. Go back and look at that previous video where we defined elliptic, parabolic, and hyperbolic partial differential equations. If we use second order accurate central difference approximations for the first and second order derivatives, then we get this mess right here. So here's the second derivative in x, first derivative in x, second derivative in y, first derivative in y, and I've used our usual ij notation to indicate, for example, a evaluated at x of i and y sub j. If we gather together everything times each of our u's, we get our finite difference equation. So it's everything times ui plus 1j, ui minus 1j, uij plus 1, ui minus j plus 1, and uij. The little a, b, c, d, and e coefficients you can see here and they encapsulate all those variable coefficients. And again, we have the right-hand side. So this is our usual one, two, three, four, five point finite difference stencil. The point itself, north, south, east, and west. And we're gonna represent this in the shorthand, L operating on U hat is equal to F. U hat here will be the exact solution to this differential equation. L is the difference operator, everything operating on U on the left-hand side. So whenever you see the L, just imagine this difference operator. Then we can define the error. The error is the difference between the exact solution, u hat, and the numerical solution, u. So we'll call that e for the error. Then the residual, as we've seen before, is just f minus lu. So for an approximate solution for u, f minus lu tells us how wrong that solution is. That's the residual for that solution. As always, if u happen to be equal to u hat, the exact solution, then the residual, of course, would be zero. So let's start with this representation, L u hat is equal to f. Our difference operator operating on the exact solution is equal to f. From this expression for the error, u hat is equal to e plus u. So let's substitute that in here. So we have L operating on e plus L operating on u is equal to f. Solving for L e, that's equal to f minus L u but f minus LU, well, that's just the residual. So what we've done is shown a different way to express the same finite difference equation. Instead of being for U hat, the original dependent variable, it's now for the error. And you'll notice that the right-hand side is now the residual. So this equation is equivalent to this equation, but now for the error. We'll see why that's useful and helpful in a little bit. Now I want to introduce the coarse grid correction, or the CGC scheme. This is the process by which we use coarser grids to update the solution and accelerate the iterative process. So let me first define the various grids because we're going to be going between a finer and a coarser grid. The fine grid, we're going to denote by capital omega H. H is what mathematicians use to indicate delta X, so it's the grid size. And then the coarse grid will be capital omega 2H. So H is like delta X, that's the fine grid. 2h like 2 delta x, that's the coarse grid taking every other point. So the way this will look is if these solid dots are the fine grid, sorry my picture wasn't very good here, and then the circled points 
that is my coarse grid if we take every other point out to get the coarse grid. So we have our fine grid and our coarse grid. We're going to need to be able to move information between these two grids. And the way we do that is using the restriction operator and the interpolation or the prolongation operator. The restriction operator takes us from the fine grid to the coarse grid. So it's going to move information from the fine to the coarse grid. The interpolation operator moves from the coarse grid to the fine grid. So from coarse back to fine. So here are the steps in the coarse grid correction sequence. The first step is to relax or iterate on the original difference equation LU is equal to F on the fine grid. You see the H superscripts on all of these in this equation. So we're iterating relaxing on the finest grid for the original variable U. We could use Gauss-Seidel, we could use ADI, and we're going to do that new one times. Once we have an approximation for U on the fine grid, we're going to use that approximation, you read this from right to left, F minus LU, which is the residual on the fine grid, and then restrict it using the restriction operator from the fine to the coarse grid to get the residual on the coarse grid. So we start with UH, we get RH, we restrict it to 2H, and that's step two. Once we have that residual, that is the right-hand side of our error equation, which we're then going to solve put that in quotes for now because I'm not sure how I'm going to do that, that we're going to solve on the coarse grid. But again, notice that it's the error equation, Le is equal to R, that we're solving on this coarser grid. Once we have that solution for the error, we can use that to correct the solution on the finer grid. Again, reading from right to left, we have the error on the coarse grid. We interpolate that up to the fine grid, use that to correct the approximation that we had previously from step one to get a new approximation for you on that fine grid. So in that way we've used this coarse grid correction to correct the original approximation that we had in step one on the fine grid with now a better approximation using the coarse grid correction. Finally, we'll relax again on the original difference equation LU is equal to F on the fine grid and we'll do that new two times. Once we've completed these steps in the coarse grid correction, we should have a better approximation for the solution U than we had when we started. Here's how it looks graphically. Now you've seen me doing the hand motions. Here it is a little more explicitly. So anything done on this level is on the fine grid. Everything done on this level is on the coarse grid. The open circles represent relaxation. The down arrows represent restriction and the up arrows represent interpolation. So step one was to relax on the fine grid on the original variable u. We then calculate the residual and restrict it down to the coarser grid. Then we relax on the error equation in step three. That error we interpolate back up to the finer grid. In step four and in step five, we relax on the original solution and use that to correct the uh solution that we had in step one. And this is the primary component of all multigrid methods. So the multigrid methods that I'll show you where we put this all together, at its core, it's a whole bunch of these coarse grid corrections. In fact, the solve in step three is actually going to be to recursively add another coarse grid correction. So before I show you an example of how this process works, let me just make a few remarks. First of all, this new one and new two. Remember, that's the number of iterations in step one and step two on the original difference equation on the fine grid. Typically, those are very small, one, two, three kinds of numbers. The recognition here is that there's not much benefit in iterating beyond one or two or three times. It's better that we do the coarse grid correction. That will be more effective in bringing down the total errors. And again, I'll show you that by example in a moment. In this coarse grid correction scheme, you'll note that it's the residual that's being restricted and it's the error that's being interpolated. But when we talk about these specific operations, interpolation, restriction, relaxation, I'm going to present them as if they are operating on the dependent variable u. But that's just the input to the function. The function can interpolate, restrict, relax on any one of these quantities. So just keep that in mind. Now we're going to return to this simple one-dimensional example that we considered in the previous video to motivate these multigrid methods. Now is u double prime is equal to zero with homogeneous Dirichlet boundary conditions at both ends. 
and I'm going to choose the new one and new two to be three here, just for the sake of illustration. My initial guess is going to involve two modes, 16 and 40. So a higher frequency mode with 40 and a lower frequency mode with 16. So you see that here. So you see the basic oscillatory behavior with K is equal to 16 and then a higher frequency mode on superimposed on top of that corresponding to the K is equal to 40. And we want to see how the multigrid method acts on these two different frequencies. In all the subsequent figures, which again come from Briggs, the multigrid tutorial that I mentioned in the previous video, I'll superimpose this initial guess on the solution at that particular stage so you can see how much work has been done or not done. So step one, after only one relaxation sweep on the fine grid, you can see how much the error has been reduced. Just one sweep through that one dimensional grid. And the reason why the error has been reduced so dramatically is because it's those high frequency modes, the K is equal to 40 modes, that you can see are almost completely eliminated. And we only have the lower frequency mode left. After three relaxation sweeps, so two additional sweeps, you can see that the error has been reduced a bit more, but not nearly as much as in that first iteration. So you can see there's a point of diminishing returns where there's not much value in continuing this iterative process on the fine grid, and it's better that we do the coarse grid correction in order to accelerate the convergence process. So at this stage, we take our numerical solution, which of course is approximate, we get the residual, we restrict the residual to the coarse grid, and then we do step three on that coarse grid. Step three is to relax here one relaxation sweep on the coarse grid. You can see that's reduced the air somewhat. Two additional sweeps, so three total relaxation sweeps on the coarse grid, and you can see it's reduced the air quite a bit. And the reason why this accelerates the convergence process, once again, is because low frequency modes on a fine grid appear as higher frequency modes on the coarse grid. We then take the air and interpolate it back up in step four to the fine grid, and we use that to correct the original approximation that we had from step one for UH. Then, if we in step five relax three additional times, you'll see that the error gets reduced even further. So if you count up the total number of relaxation sweeps, it was three plus three plus three, so that's nine. If we were just to have done nine relaxation sweeps on the fine grid using gauss L, for example, we would be nowhere near this small of an error at this stage. In addition, all the work that's being done on the coarse grid, you only have half as many intervals, so it requires much less computational time as well. So you can see how this is accelerating the iterative process.